Welcome to Geraldine Hickey and Friends. Coming up tonight, Irvi Majumda, Kirsty Webbick, Annie Louie, and Daniel Connell. Now give it up for Geraldine Hickey. Thank you so much for coming out to the show tonight, guys. This is going to be heaps and heaps of fun. Uh, God, it's great to be out. It's so good to be out. Uh, who who got shit done in lockdown, though? Anyone do anything? Like, went, oh, I might try this and actually did it? Like, I, like I did, thanks. Um, <laughs> baked some bread. Like, remember that in the first phase of the lockdown? Like, oh, I'm going to bake some bread. I did it. I did it. I baked some bread. Um, just normal bread, though. None of that sourdough. Just a normal loaf of bread. Right? I did that. Did a few, actually. Thank you. Um, fresh pasta. Also made that. Made fresh pasta. Uh, did I eat that fresh pasta? Yes. All of it. Did I eat the bread that I baked? Yes. Multiple loaves. Did I put on nine kilos in lockdown? Yes. Yes, I did. Did I lose that nine kilos? Yes. Yeah, I know. I did, thank you. Does anybody know that? No. Because <laughs> so I went into lockdown looking like this. <laughs> I went into this is me, I went into lockdown. Oh, see you guys, I've gone into lockdown. <laughs> and then look, shut the door and then <laughs> and then oh it's nearly time to come out of lockdown. <laughs> Exactly the same. No one knew. Did a lot of things in lockdown. I didn't. I, you know, one thing that I did is um, I did a bit of gardening um, in our backyard. We had um, some agapanthers and we dug out the agapanthers. Has anyone ever dug out agapanthers before? Yeah? The, like, give us a yell if you dug out agapanthers. Oh. <laughs> Here's the thing, there are only two types of people in this world. Those that have dug out agapanthers <laughs> and those that haven't. Um, this is mostly for the people that have dug out agapanthers. <laughs> How shit is it digging out agapanthers? <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard digging out agapanthers. No, no, but some of you are probably sitting there going, What's an... I don't know what an agapanthus is. <laughs> Get your phone out, Google it, I don't care. <laughs> it's fine. But the agapanthus, that's the, the really long stem flower with like, it's either white or purple at the top. Looks like a kid's drawn a firework, yeah? <laughs> like you'll see them in suburbs like Camberwell in Kew, you know? This, actually, they're, they're everywhere. I could name any suburb and you would go, yeah. And now... Every time you walk past an agapanther, you're going to walk past and go, oh, that's an agapanther. And then you'll go, Geraldine Hickey, right? <laughs> and then you'll buy tickets to... Anyway, it'll be... It's a great marketing tool, agapanthers, right? Anyway, they're very difficult to dig out. So when you find someone else that has also dug out agapanthers, you bond, right? Straight up, you go, dug out... Oh, mate, I've dug out an agapanther before. <laughs> Like if you like if you have a garden and like maybe you want to hire someone to like do some landscaping in your backyard, like a landscaper will go, all right, so you want this, you want that, and then you go, oh yeah, and also there's some agapanthers that I wanted to get, and he'll go, absolutely not, I'm not, I'm not available anymore. Right? I went to our local mitre ten and I said, mate, I'm trying to dig out some agapanthers, and he went, oh, agapanthers, agapanthers. Dynamite, all oh, five. Like he gets it. <laughs> Understands, we bonded. Now every time I go in there, he knows me, right? So we connect. <laughs> we dug out those agapanthers um, and a few other things and then uh, in its place we dug it, we dug it like a, a hole, you know, laid it out and, um, 
and then we built a lesbian pit. <laughs> and I saw something go, that's fair, what's a lesbian pit? <laughs> it is a pit built by lesbians. <laughs> of which I am one. Um, so basically, um, it, it's a, some people call it a sunken patio. Uh, so we just have an area <laughs> in our backyard that we paved with bricks and we put a nice a solid wall behind it on just on one side and uh, and then in the middle of it we put a fire pit and then we put some chairs around it and we sit around and have a glass of wine around the fire. Beautiful, right? Um, but then maybe once a month we will take those chairs and the fire pit out and then we'll fill it with mud <laughs> and, and wrestle. <laughs> and there's a lesbian pit. And then maybe once a year, uh, we will sacrifice men in there. <laughs> <laughs> Took out the Agar Panthers, <laughs> put in some Penrith Panthers. <laughs> Can't wait for someone from Sydney to log on to watch this. <laughs> Okay. Oh, oh, mate. <laughs> they're either going to stop right there or they're going to think I'm the greatest comedian of all time. <laughs> so I'm happy to go with either. Um, so this is what's going to happen. Uh, we're here for, for my um, show, Jolene Hickey and Friends. Uh, thank you so much for coming out and being here. This is um, probably going to be the greatest night of your lives. <laughs> just, just FYI. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm going to bring on our first act. Uh, you're going to like just set the room on fire. Uh, imagine that you were like at my lesbian pit and... <laughs> The mud is in the pit. <laughs> all right? This is where we're at. Uh, all right, everybody, are we ready? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, will you please welcome to the stage one of my first friends and one of my greatest, Irvie Majumda! Uh, give it up for Jolene Hickey. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be out, isn't it? Um, I went a little bit crazy during lockdown. Uh, like when I got the call to do this gig, I wasn't sure if it was Geraldine or one of the many new voices in my head <laughs> developed. Um, I did have to spend part of my lockdown with my parents. Did anyone else have to do that? Yeah. Yep. Um, I don't know how you felt about it. Mine were quite annoying. Um, one of the annoying things about them is that they're quite stingy. Um, anyone else's parents that? Yeah, thank you for feeling me. Um, they're pretty stingy. It's very annoying. Um, on the one hand, they do. They, it's great because you know they moved here from India when I was six. They had to save up everything, and that's why you know we have a better life because of them. So thank you very much. On the other hand, we're fine now. It's <laughs> it's been twenty years, um, and they still act like World War Three is about to happen any second. Um, it's frustrating. <laughs> Um, my dad has an Excel spreadsheet of all of our spending from June 1988 to today. <laughs> yeah, no, this is actually true. Um, it's interactive and he's proud of it, so... <laughs> Bless. Um, that's great. Uh, I don't know if your parents did this. Um, my dad, instead of buying a $5 perfect mango, he will spend $10 on 20 really brown mushy ones. <laughs> It's like his rule of thumb is, I'm not buying it unless it's brown and seeping liquid. Yeah. Um, and it's annoying because my whole life I grew up thinking that I hated fruit, um, but it turns out that it was just off. <laughs> You're like, oh, strawberries aren't meant to taste like rancid acid. I didn't know. Uh, 
Um, I do love my parents very much, it's just because they tried so hard to give us a great life. Um, and they were a very typical migrant story. You know, they cared a lot about me and my sister's education, probably more than they cared about us. Um, <laughs> just education was a big deal and uh, one way that they thought they could help us get one was to send us to an all-girls school. Um, did anyone here go to an all-girls school? Give us a cheer. Yeah. Yes. Um, who liked it? No. <laughs> no one. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I liked my girls' school. It was pretty good. Uh, it wasn't a normal, you know, private girls' school. It was a select entry school, sorry to brag. Um, <laughs> you had to, like, do a test to get in and everyone was a huge nerd. Um, and we were still were bitchy, like, just not about looks and money and stuff. Um, so you wouldn't hear things like, oh, my God, did you see what Courtney's wearing? What a fucking slut. You wouldn't hear that. Um, instead, we were bitchy about brains. So you'd hear things like, Oh my God, Priya sat the Gamsat three times and now she's going to be a doctor before me. Fuck my life. <laughs> <laughs> we were always stressed, always crying on the train home. Um, and not, never because... There always girls crying on the train home from my school. Um, not because they'd lost their boyfriend or, you know, their phone. It was always because we'd lost our calculators. <laughs> Um, and rightly so, because they're very expensive, so... <laughs> um, anyway, I did like my girls' school a lot because when I got there, it was very multicultural, which was awesome. Everyone was from somewhere else. Um, but I quickly realised that we all just easily called each other racial slurs, like, all the time. Um, did anyone else at school do this? Probably don't want to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you kind of just got really used to it and it was... It made sense to us at the time as like little year nines. We were like, yeah, that makes sense. We all had our place, like each race had their place in the social triangle that we formed. Um, you know, you had your Asians, your curries like me. Yep, um, proud represent. And um, your skips. And initially I was like, what is a skip? Uh, why? And it turns out because kangaroos. I don't know. It's just like why people don't have a food group for some reason. <laughs> just the national animal. Um, so that's cool. <laughs> and we kind of all lived in this, like, e racial, ecological... I don't even know what these words are. Ecological system. Um, at the very top of the pyramid, you had your hybrid races. Um, we... <laughs> they were just better than us and we knew it. Um, <laughs> if you were, like, a mixed-race kid at my school, you got everything you wanted. You were the hottest, the smartest. Um, and we just kind of bowed out of the way because they were the way of the future. So... <laughs> It was fine by us. Um, you know, you had your Eurasians, your Chindians. Um, some <laughs> sometimes I was mistaken for a Chindian, just saying. Um, <laughs> and they were the best days of my life. Um, <laughs> anyway, it was good. Um, <laughs> we lived in this harmony. Um, and <laughs> I just remember we were all living in peace. And then one day, uh, the teachers barged into our school assembly and they were like, Girls, you've got to stop standing at the platforms on Flinders Street calling each other curries. It's, good. it's making the school look bad. Um, so I just remember, like, turning to my fellow curries and being like, what the fuck is this bitch on about? Um, didn't help that most of our teachers at our school looked like they were from the first fleet. <laughs> we were like, go back to Captain Cook. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> But they underestimated us because we were silent then. But by because we were smart, by the time we got home, we you know we'd hacked some computer systems. We're all on MSN, um, and you know we had unionized. We had a network. We had a treaty. Um, we were gonna fight the teachers back. And so we came back to school the next day with this force of intellectual arguments that the teachers just couldn't take. Um, and I remember the second assembly, we had a spokesperson who was like a to-be lawyer. And she did this empowered speech that, where she was like, we as curries reserve the rights to call each other curries. She's a mild curry, she gets it. Hot curries, don't even go there. <laughs> like jungle curry, cray cray, papadams, rogue and josh. It just went on and on. It was like this food explosion. <laughs> and by the end, the teachers were like, okay, you can call each other curries, it's fine. Um, and we did for the rest of the time at the school. Um, so anyway, it's funny because I recently got um, my invitation to go back to our like 10 year reunion, even though it looks like I graduated yesterday, I know. Um, <laughs> 
Um, and it was weird reflecting on this kind of weird moment of empowerment that was very problematic. Um, <laughs> and laughing at the fact that if I went back to this reunion, oblivious to the fact that it's 2021, that we've had some social movements going like, hey Priya, what's up? Are you still my tikka masala? <laughs> um, which I won't do. <laughs> um, that's my time, I think. So thank you so much for being an awesome audience. I'm Evie Madanka. Bye. everybody I have good friends and I'm gonna bring another one on now are you ready for the next act yeah. please welcome to the stage Kirsty Weeby Don't worry, all oh, right, I'll work it out. Um, should we go around the room and say a few words about ourselves? <laughs> no, all right, uh, fair enough. Uh, that used to be a very funny joke pre Panny D. <laughs> it was very funny because people would look around and they'd be like, there's too many of us. <laughs> it's not feasible. She doesn't want us to go around the room and say a few words about ourselves. Like last year before we went into lockdown, I said that joke at Hamer Hall. And everyone went, <laughs> there are 2,000 of us here. <laughs> it's impractical. She doesn't want that. <laughs> and about two weeks later, I did it at Enmore Theatre in Sydney, right? And everyone was like, oh, there are 1,800 of us. We're not going to have to introduce ourselves. She's off her face. <laughs> and about two weeks after that, I did it at Falls Festival in Byron Bay. And everyone was like, there are thousands of us and we're off our <laughs> and you know the thing now is that we've got limited capacity so everyone has a look around and they're like <laughs> I think she's serious <laughs> like I see you all like just looking at the person that you're sitting next to just going have you prepared anything <laughs> are you going to go funny or serious like you're all panic stricken <laughs> I'm going to say something heartwarming when it's my turn. <laughs> you can relax. I've prepared some things. I'll just do that. What do you reckon? Yeah. 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 You're into that. You're into it. I've, uh, I've been doing a lot of walking lately, right? Lots of walking. Developed a real habit for walking last year, just in lieu of anything else to do, right? Just like walking. Walk there, walk here. Within restrictions, of course. If there's any cops in here, definitely. Within restrictions. <laughs> when we were only allowed outdoors for 60 minutes a day, I'd err on the side of caution and come back at the 59 minute mark. You know? <laughs> Very serious about these things. Uh, but lots of walks. Like huge walks sometimes when we're allowed to. Massive walks, long walks, very long walks, right? Like sometimes I'd go for a walk so long that I'd come home and I'd feel guilty that I hadn't raised money for charity. I was like, that one could have been a real cash cow, you know? <laughs> like, it just went on and on forever. But what happened was, over time, I developed a very significant mask tan. And at that time, it didn't matter, right? I was like, who's seeing me without a mask on? No one, you know? And then on, on this one day, Dan Andrews did the press conference and he goes, all right, as of tomorrow, you don't need to wear a mask outdoors anymore. And I was like, all right, this is... This is great. And then I was like, oh, no, but now people are going to see that there's a real top deck affair happening <laughs> here, right? <laughs> and then comedy started opening up and I was like, oh, no, I'm going to be on stage in the bright lights and everyone's going to know what's happened, <laughs> right? And so, and, and so the next day we were allowed outdoors without a mask on and so what I did was I went for a very long walk in the sunshine in my Batman mask. <laughs> I was like, this will fix it. Anyway, it backfired horribly and I spent the afternoon fighting crime. Um, <laughs> these things happen, don't they? <laughs> it's awesome being back doing stand-up, though. It's, it's, it's so good. I was, I was reminiscing recently on a tour that I did uh, a little while ago and uh, five comedians, we went out into the regions and uh, we did a bunch of shows and on this uh, one particular leg, four of us comedians were from Australia. One was from England, right? And we rolled into this place 
in WA. It was a very hot day, like it was an objectively hot day. Everyone was hot. We were all struggling. But our mate from London, was he was a puddle. <laughs> like he was a, a, like a little bit left of a man and mostly puddle, right? <laughs> And, and he had no energy left. He was like, he was languishing. That's the only word I could use to describe it, right? We got to the point with him where we were standing in this car park and he could barely even talk anymore and he was just gesturing at the weather. <laughs> like he could barely keep his eyes open and he was just, like just the arm into the atmosphere. Just, can we fix it? Like... Will it change? <laughs> How long are we putting up with this for, right? He was really, really battling. And so, so we're in a place called Port Hedland at the time right now. Give me a woo if you've been to Port Hedland. Woo! All right, no enthusiasm and that's correct. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> that's the standard reaction to that question is woo, yeah. I regret everything. Um, <laughs> Now, for the rest of you who didn't woo and who have never been to Port Helen, um, keep it up. Keep up the good work. There's nothing for you there. Right, there's nothing for you there. We're a very hot part of the country. So we're, we're up there. We're in Port Helen now, mate. He's having a real rough one. And he goes, I'm going to go for a swim in that beach. Right, that feels valid, right? Apart from the fact we're in Australia. And I go to him, no, no, you can't just go for a swim in that beach. And he's like, what do you mean? By this stage, you're just crawling along the road. <laughs> what do you mean I can't go for a swim that beach? And I, and I was like, you're in Australia, mate. You can't just get into a body of water willy-nilly in Australia. We've got to do some research. We don't know what's going on with Mother Nature out there. Like, we don't know what that beach is capable of. OK, we need to find out. So I, I thought I'd help him. So I go over to the receptionist at the motel and I say to her very specifically, perhaps too specifically, are there any crocodiles in that beach. I was in a real crocodile phase. We don't know why. Don't ask questions. <laughs> Are there any crocodiles in that beach? And she said, ah! <laughs> No! <laughs> and our mate went, Ripper, I'm going to go for a swim. And I said, no, you're not. And he said, yes, I am. She said, there are no crocodiles in that beach. And I said, she did not say that. What she said is she has no fucking idea but wants to be involved in this conversation. <laughs> right? It just wasn't enough for me, you know? Like, we're talking about crocodiles. I wanted to, like, nah, one hasn't been spotted since the 30s. Right? But meanwhile, she's just tossing a coin behind the desk, like, heads for yes, tails for no. <laughs> But then I thought, this isn't fair, like, I don't know this person, maybe this is how she speaks. So I thought, <laughs> I'll test her, right? So I go to her, do you think tomorrow we could have a late checkout? And she said, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you see, she can do it. She can. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why I'm telling this story anyway. It's actually, it's not great. Like, he was a lovely guy and a great comedian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where uh, <laughs> I'm going to miss him terribly. Um, <laughs> Julie got it wrong that day. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. Uh, it wasn't a crocodile. It was a shark and that's on me, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't ask about those. But it worked out really well for me because the following day when we were checking out, she said to me, do you owe us any money? Did you have anything from the minibar? And I went... You've been awesome. I've been Kirsty Weebeck. Thank you very much. Kirsty Weebeck, everybody. Yeah, I can't fucking wait to travel again. I, I love holidays. I love them. I love holidaying around Australia and pretending like I'm a boomer with five kids. I love it. I love going to places... I like, you know, travelling around places. Well, this is what I like to do. My partner and I, we like to go to a place and then I do the research of what's, what's the thing to do in this town. Um, we went to New Zealand last year. Um, yeah, New Zealand. I love it. Uh, we went to Waitomo Caves. Um, has anyone... <laughs> anyone else been to Waitomo Caves? 
You've been to White Time My Caves? All right, so when you went there, like, when you went in the caves, how did you do it? Like, did you go in a boat or did you walk? Yeah. You went in a boat? Walk down and then the boat. Walk down and then the boat. Mm. I chose the more adventurous option. <laughs> and it's, you, there were options, you, you know, you go for a bit of a walk and have a look at it because it's glow worms in the Waitomo Cave. So you could go for a walk or you could go for a float in a boat or blackwater rafting. <laughs> and I love adventure. <laughs> so I went blackwater rafting. Right? But here's the thing, sometimes I get a little bit excited. I think, oh, I, you know, imagine what something is going to be like and then I get there and um, reality does not meet my expectation. <laughs> so, to avoid that, because usually my expectation is pretty high and reality is not the same, you know? So I need to bring myself down so I read reviews to get a better idea of what's going to happen. Right? And I was reading the reviews for the blackwater rafting at Waitomo Caves and one of the reviews was, this isn't very exciting. I thought this would be more adventurous and it was really tame. And then my partner read it and she went, oh, it's so annoying when people write these reviews and they've got no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> and I went, what do you mean? And she went, it's blackwater rafting. And I went, yeah. <laughs> And she went, no. Do you know what blackwater rafting is? And I went, yeah. And she went, think about it. White water rafting is called white water rafting because the water's all churned up and that makes it white, yeah? But blackwater rafting, the water is still. <laughs> So it's floating. <laughs> she went, yes. And I went, but in the dark, woo, adventure, let's go, right? So, I'm, so we went, we did blackwater rafting, it was so good. And then you get there and then like, they give you a wetsuit and then they give you a tube. And then they handed me a tube, like the guy, one of the guys was like, take the big tube, mate. Take the big tube. It's more comfy with the big tube. And I went, all right, I'll take the big tube. It's not comfy. It's not comfy <laughs> at all. You know, big tube, big tube means big hole, right? <laughs> so it just meant that, like, I, when I go round, I just, I want to, I want to be like, um, like, like that. I just want to be, oh, <laughs> look at those glow worms. Oh, this is lovely. But I'm in a big tube, so I'm like that. Or I have to get up and I'm like that, just on the top. I just want to be there, but I sink down. I have to get on top. And it's not comfy, all right? It's not comfy at all, right? And at one point, I noticed that one of the guides was like, um, they were just, they weren't in their tubes. They were just holding onto their tubes and they're walking through and going, oh, yeah, this, so this has been here for a long time and this is glow worms and blah. And so I'm sick of, like, this shit. <laughs> So I went, fuck, bugger it, I'm going to get out. I'm just going to get out and walk with my tube. So I'm, I'm sick of this, right? And I get out and then... <sighs> turns out we were in a very deep part of the cave. <laughs> or, the, there was no, nothing to stand on. It was just... The water... It was very deep. <laughs> Real deep. And um, I don't know if you've tried to get back into a tube... <laughs> A big tube <laughs> in deep water. It's very difficult, right? So I'm like, oh. and the tube just flips up and just flips over all the time. I'm like, oh, it's fine. I can just, I can tread water. It's fine. <laughs> just holding on to the tube and I'm at the back of the group. And this is when they stop and they start, you know, talking about something. And I'm like, just at the back, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> and then someone else in the group turns around and goes, Oh no, someone's fallen out of their tube! Someone's fallen out of their tube! Excuse me, someone's fallen out of their tube! And then the guy's like, Oh, guys, don't be embarrassed to tell us if you've fallen out of your tube! Don't be embarrassed, it happens, don't worry about it. I'm like, I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I've fallen out of my tube. I'm embarrassed to tell you that I did it deliberately. Um, 
All right, you guys ready for your next act? Oh my God, we really are having the greatest night of our lives. Don't forget about that. Please keep that round of applause going. Bring it up, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. Welcome to the stage, Annie Louise. To be here, my name is Annie. I am a chronic overthinker. Something I've been very self-conscious about recently is going to Asian restaurants and eating there with my family. Because I'm very worried that white people will see me and my family eating there and think that the restaurant is good. <laughs> Sometimes it's not good. And I'm worried that all of you lot are gonna pile in and next minute broadsheets arrived and they built a new suburb and it's all my fault. <laughs> so I don't really eat out anymore. <laughs> I live in a share house. Anybody live in a share house? Give me a woo! woo! Yes, my people. Okay, so I live in the clown car of share houses. We've had 10 people live there in the last eight months, okay? There was Carlos, there was Juan, Alex, Marlene, Xavier, there was Finn, Hugh, Christine, myself, and the other head tenant, Matthew. There's always a Matthew in a share house, right? Is this going on socials? <laughs> Tag a Matthew who lives in a share house. <laughs> and look, think about the most annoying housemate habit, okay? Have one in your mind, just have a think right now because I can certainly top that because one of my housemates plays the bagpipes. <laughs> yeah, I had to live through this during lockdown. I had to try and flip the thought and just turn it a little bit more positive, right? And now I've come to the conclusion that I actually feel sorry for you all because you're never going to experience the feeling of sitting on a toilet and listening to bagpipes. <laughs> I'm like, this must be how the queen shits. Yeah. So good. I also lived through lockdown with two backpackers who had started camping out in the living room. It was unusable, I couldn't use that space. They had a bedroom, they decided they wanted to live there instead. Never went out. One of them... Right, this bitch was journaling all the time. Like, what are you journaling about? You were sitting over there, now you're sitting over there. What the fuck are you reflecting on? I had a lot of anger during lockdown. I called my mum, I was like, mum, have you ever journaled before? And she says, this is her exact words, journaled, I don't even have time to take a shit. I found out where I get my anger from. We also had to interview halfway between uh, the second lockdown. We were just desperate for anybody, really. I knew this guy was a weirdo. When I opened the door, I said, hi, how are you? He just walked in and started looking through all the bedrooms. <laughs> I was like, fine, we're desperate. You're welcome. Please come through, set up your stuff. And uh, then the screaming started. <laughs> yes, the screaming. Uh, he likes to scream when he walks down the stairs. No reason, just... Ah! And he yells a lot of things that are very uh, mundane, but they should not be yelled, like, I miss my cat! <laughs> yeah, inside thoughts, right? And because we lived in a bubble during lockdown, I thought all of this stuff was normal, but now we're allowed to have friends in, and they're like, what's that bagpipe noise? What's that screaming? And I'm just like, what noise? Would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> So that's a concerning thing for sure. Uh, I've actually kept this job as a comedian for the longest time. I think I've not been good at any other jobs. I've actually gone and diversified. I became a marriage celebrant recently. I did a celebrancy course and I know it sounds like a celibacy course and <laughs> trust me it was very confusing when I was single for two years and not having any sex either by choice and uh, my friends were all like oh it's so terrible. I mean, she's not getting laid. She's decided to become a nun. She's doing a celibacy <laughs> course. Very sad. Um, but during the course, we learned that in order to make a marriage valid, you have to use a lot of legal language. Like, one of the words that we use a lot is solemnize, which I just know. It sounds a lot like another word, right? <laughs> That's a lot less legal. And I'm going to fuck it up one of these days. I'm definitely going to sodomize somebody's marriage. <laughs> Very sorry. But when I thought about it, I think that is the key to a long-lasting marriage. Just a little bit of anal. Just a little bit. Don't go overboard, okay? Just a little bit. <laughs> I live in the city. Anyone live in the city? 
close to the city? No, no city slickers. Okay, good. You're not going to be able to experience this, okay? This became my backyard. This is where I go for walks now. I've had to adjust from living in the suburbs. I was walking down Swanson Street and a homeless guy came up to me asking for change. And at that exact moment I opened my mouth, a pigeon flew on into my face, bounced off and flew away. <laughs> and the homeless man said, Oh God, I am so sorry. <laughs> For that moment in time, his life was going pretty well. He was like, I need money, but not your money. <laughs> yeah, I live in a share house. I'm just working for myself. I decided last year I should make a little bit of extra cash and I became a funeral assistant. Yeah, in, during a pandemic, what a choice, I know. Um, it was a family friend's business. I wanted to get some work experience with the whole uh, being a celebrant thing. And I ended up with a job, driving some hearses. And during the job interview, the questions were a little odd. Uh, they asked me, have you ever driven a hearse? And I said, no. And then their, their second question was, have you ever worked funerals? And I said, no. And I feel like those questions were out of order. <laughs> like, imagine you had driven a hearse, but never worked a funeral. <laughs> You're just going around, people are like, sick hearse, is that for funerals? And you're like, no, nah, it's for fun. <laughs> the government was offering a lot of subsidised courses. One of the ones that I was looking into was Certificate 4 in Embalming. And that's where you learn to preserve people after they've passed away. And I looked at the first unit, I was like, okay, maybe I could do this. Unit 1, apply first aid. I'm like, why do you need to apply first aid? They're dead. <laughs> or are they? What if you're applying first aid? You're like, holy shit, this person's like alive, fuck. Like, I can't handle that. So I just like closed my laptop, yeeted it out the window. I was done. Now I've decided, you know, just start focusing on being a really good funeral assistant to the point where I can apply and get a job at White Lady Funerals and confuse the fuck out of everybody. <laughs> slow burn thank you <laughs> I've also been working on my health I thought what a great time now that I've got heaps of spare time to go check in with all of my medical appointments I've decided to try Chinese medicine and I went to a Chinese doctor he was very cocky he was like of course you should try Chinese medicine you're Chinese and I'm like did I just pay $300 for my diagnosis to be I'm Chinese <laughs> like I don't wear shoes in the house I love to drink hot water I had a feeling. <laughs> There's a big difference between Western and Chinese medicine. In Western me medicine, everything is about privacy. They're all like, please come into this room. Shh, would you like your mum to come? Okay, she has permission, come on through. Everything at the Chinese medicine appointment was done in the lobby. And uh, my mum had taken me there and the Chinese medicine man was feeling all of my pressure points and yelling out diagnoses. He was like, oh, you're iron deficient. You've got no energy. What are your periods like? And my mum jumps in and she's like, oh, please help her. She's desperately single as well. <laughs> and then the herb lady's there. She's like, I've got something for that. And then she winks at her husband. She's like, it worked for me. And he winks back because they're married. And then uh, I'm like, okay, finally I can get a word in. I'm like, okay, this is one of my symptoms. And as soon as I said it, a grandma comes out, this Asian Chinese like lady, she's like 105 and she's like, oh my God, that happened to me too. I didn't shit for 13 days. I'm like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> she's walking over, she's getting picked up by her daughter and then her daughter looks at my mum. My mum looks back, she's like, Kim. And Kim's like, Mrs. Louie. And now they're hugging and I'm like, holy shit, can I put my pants back on? <laughs> That's my time, everybody. You've been fantastic. I'm Annie Louie, thank you so much. One more time for Annie Louie. Now it's time to raise the roof for our final act, Daniel Connell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jez. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. I hope you're having a lovely time. I certainly am waiting out the back to be on at the last uh, of the show. Um, it's been fun, it's been good. I, um, I'll tell you something that happened to me uh, during lockdown. Now, I've never witnessed this before, but I was at my local Coles, as most of us were through lockdown, because we could go there and spend sort of six, seven hours a day at my local Coles. And I witnessed, <laughs> I witnessed someone shoplift for the first time ever. Never seen that before in my life. I witnessed, I estimate he was about 14 years old, this boy, he shoplifted. He wasn't shoplifting like standard things like chockey bars or cans of Coke, like I was. Right? I witnessed a 14-year-old boy put a meat tray down his pants. <laughs> 
pretty brazen, isn't it? Just a full barbecue pack, a few sausage, a few chops, a few little steakettes, just all down the front of his pants. I saw him do it and I thought, that's hilarious. There's no one else here. It's late at night. I'll have a bit of fun here. And I just went, hey, mate, you don't need to put your shopping down your pants. There's red baskets out in the front, right? <laughs> bit of fun. And he swings around really aggressive and goes, oh, fuck off. 14 years old, tell him to, very aggressive, tell him to fuck off. Would have been 50 kilos tops this kid. Well, 52 with the meat tray, right? But nothing of him, right? It's just this tiny little kid telling me to fuck off. Before he told me to fuck off, I couldn't care less about the shoplifting. I couldn't care less. I wasn't going to ruin my Tuesday night. Seeing that I was getting a couple of cornettos. I wanted to go home. After he told me to fuck off, I thought, I want to kill this kid. I want this kid dead. I want him dead tonight. I want him dead now, right? That's it. I'm going to jam a cornetto right down his throat. I want him dead now. I said... I'm going to get security, mate. He goes, don't get security. If you do, I'll knock you out. I said, you're not ever knocking a hole in the plastic on the meat tray, champ. You're not <laughs> knocking me out at all. So I, I go to take off to get security. And before I've even turned, security are on me. The main security guard and the boss, they've obviously seen him on CCTV. They've come and they get around him, right? And the big security boss is like, Jared knows his name. It's not his first rodeo, Jared. Right, Jared, put the meat tray back. And he goes, what meat tray? He clearly has a massive protruding <laughs> meat tray. <laughs> Looks like a boogie board down his pants, right? <laughs> what meat tray? And he's like, the one down your pants, mate. Just put it back and we won't call the cops. As soon as the cops are mentioned, down go the shoulders on Jared. He slunks right in. He just pulls the meat tray out. The meat's kind of scooched up one end. He <laughs> levels it out like a gentleman and then pops it back into the fridge. <laughs> then just skulks out of the store, right? And they didn't press any charges or anything. He just, they just let him go. And I just stood there, big round of applause. I thought that was fucking great. Great to witness. Thanks for everybody involved. <laughs> Took two things away from that experience, guys. Two things. One is I'm worried about our future with the kids. You know, I don't have much to do with 14-year-old kids these days. Not that I ever did, but I don't now either. <laughs> but I'm worried about our future. Are they all little meat steel and cockheads? Like, that's frustrating for our future. That's worrying. Um, second thing I took away from that experience was a half-price meat tray, which was quite nice. <laughs> um, Again. I uh, got told some disturbing news by my, my little nephew during lockdown. I'm sorry to break this to you on a lovely Sunday night here. But um, my nephew, told, he's 10, he goes to school in Canberra. He told me the great schoolyard game of stacks on has been barred because of COVID. We can't play stacks on in school level anymore. If you don't remember stacks on, it was also known as pile up or stacks on the mill. Great schoolyard game where you'd spot someone in the school level, remember that? And you'd say, right, stacks on that person. <laughs> remember that? And 10 to 15 people of different ages and sizes would run to that person, <laughs> drag them to the ground against their will. And then just stack up on top of them, basically. It's, it's in the name, Stacks On. It's been barred. It's quite disappointed when I heard it's been barred because I think Stacks On teaches kids valuable lessons in life. Doesn't it like what suffocation feels like, um, <laughs> what a broken arm feels like, <laughs> who your friends aren't. Uh, for example, like Stacks On, it made me the man I am today. I can safely say that. So, um, very anxious man. Always, uh, <laughs> always on my toes. <laughs> Don't sleep that well, but. Um, it's all right for my nephew, though, because we're a Stacks On family. We do Stacks On at family events. <laughs> so if we have a barbecue or something, my dad will call Stacks On a certain family member. We all get involved. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Nan hates it, obviously. She doesn't like it. Right? Uh, it's always Stacks On Nan, to be honest. She struggles to get away. <laughs> mm. They also about the frigid test at his school in Canberra. Can't do the frigid test anymore. Sorry to break that to you as well. Um, People remember that. If you don't remember the frigid test, guys, that was where you got two fingers like that. That's alarm bells, or isn't it? What's going on here? <laughs> remember the frigid test? And you ran them up the inside thigh of another person. And the higher you got on the thigh, the less frigid that person was. Remember that? <laughs> Any couples meet like that back in the day? Yeah. That's barred now. Can't do that anymore. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> Wasn't as surprised got that one got barred, to be honest. But... Got to wonder how that got through the board of directors in the first place, don't they? The so cut it out, guys. I'm watching. <laughs> Nan hates that too. Probably should point that out. Uh, she's, uh, <laughs> she's pretty free. No, she's all right. She's um, she, had, she had six kids. She's fine. Um, <laughs> leave you with this, guys. Absolutely lovely. Leave you with this. So, um, I want to tell you about the best answer I've ever seen anyone give. I saw this outside a pub uh, not too long ago. It was about one in the morning. I finished the show. I'm walking past the pub. I witness a man give the best answer I've ever seen anyone give in any situation, right? One in the morning, this guy's kind of half standing, half leaning up against the wall of this pub. He clearly had a massive knot, got stains down the front of his shirt, just sort of rocking, right? 
Pretty quickly, four police officers surround him all in their high-vis gear. And one of the officers tries to chat to him, but he's just too off his face. He slides down the wall onto his bum. Right? When he's on his bum, the officer that was trying to chat to him puts some blue rubber gloves on. Right? I thought, oh, I'll stick around for this. Right? Where's this guy? <laughs> hey, where's this off to? He leans, a, he leans over to the guy like this, right? puts one blue glove on either cheek, face, cheek, right? Puts it like that. Holds his face and he goes, Craig, come on, Craig. What have you taken tonight? What have you taken? And Craig gave the best answer I've ever heard. He just goes, ah, I just, I just been taking it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you guys. My name's Daniel Carlo. Enjoy the rest of your festival. Take it easy. One more time for Daniel Connell. <laughs> And also, uh, one more time for all the acts that you've seen tonight. Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, I'm going to say them all. We had Irving Majumda, then we had Kirsty Weebeck, Annie Louie, one more time for Daniel Connell. I've been Geraldine Hickey, they have been my friends. You are now my friends as well. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs>